Hello and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe, where no man has gone before. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you live from our EW10 studios in the heart of Irondale, Alabama, Mother Angelica Way, the mothership where it all began as we begin our travels through Father Spitzer's Universe. And you can help us along the way by emailing us out uh, right here and also checking us out on Facebook and sending us a tweet on Twitter. And for all things Father Spitzer, there's a couple of places to go. we got a new one. There's, of course, the Magis Center's website, magiscenter.com. Also remember, we're talking about Credible Catholic. Of course, there's a website. It's CredibleCatholic.com as well. You can check that out and follow along with what we're talking about uh, in the program today and ongoing. Speaking of wonderful things out there, besides the fact that we're talking about the evidence of God on today's show from science, kind of a part two there. We also have a wonderful book, our good friend Father uh, Horgan, who will be on with Father Mitch on Wednesday night. He's got his, his angels at our side. Wonderful, wonderful book published by EW10 Publishing, Understanding Their Power in Our Souls and the World, based on a wonderful series he did for us many years ago. Mother asked him to write the book and do the series years ago, and check that out on Father Mitch, available through our EW10 Religious Catalog. And I also want to mention one other thing. There is a great Catholic Bible study. You've asked for it. We call it Scripture and Tradition with Father Mitch. But it's really a Catholic week-by-week -week Bible study. He's talking about sin. Check it out. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful program. Is only the only Father Mitch, our other brilliant Jesuit, the one on this coast. We got one on each coast here. So, And with that being said, we head out to the West Coast, to Orange County, California, where we see Father Spitzer once more coming into view at our beautiful studios out there in the diocese. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. And... Uh, before we get started and even ask you for prayer like we usually do, we have to congratulate you that it's your birthday, Father. So we wanted to let all of your minions out there know that, uh, yes, one of your wonderful helpers let us know that it was your birthday. And just a couple of fun facts to know and tell. Uh, your birthday was on a Friday. Uh, and uh, so far in your life, you've slept about 8,035 days, just so you, you know that. Though with you working, I doubt you've slept as much as that. And uh, your next birthday next year is going to be on a Thursday. Not that we believe in horoscopes, but you're a Taurus, which means you're a bit of a bull. Which you, you might say that uh, in your earlier part of your life, you might have been known that way as well. And the other thing was, I thought there was really interesting, a couple of very interesting events happened on May 16th of different years. This one I really thought related to you. Johannes Kepler wasn't born on this day, but by his own calculations believed he was conceived on this day at 4.37 a.m. Isn't that pretty figure interesting? Figure that out. That's right, but apparently that was his. And, and Mr. Boswell meets Samuel Johnston. Johnson on this day, so Boswell's Johnson, they met for the oh, first time yeah, on this day so, in history. Yeah. Marie Antoinette married uh, King Louis the Sixteenth. President Johnson, remember him, got uh, acquitted oh, by yes. the Senate. Uh, Joan of Arc was canonized on this day as well, so there's a couple of wonderful wow. things in there. And for Yankee fans, of course, the Yankees involved in the Copacabana fight, uh, led by Billy Martin <laughs> for many years ago, for Yankee fans to remember that one. So one very close to my heart as well. And of course, it's uh, St. Simon Stock's uh, feast day. And yeah, so I asked exactly. one of your people whether you wear a brown scapular, but I understand you wear a green one. I do. I wear a green sca scapula. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's right here, <laughs> as they say, <laughs> coming right out of the shirt. <laughs> well, let me ask you, since we always talk about these things on things, sometimes people see scapulars or hear stories about scapulars, and they say, oh, it's kind of that little Catholic superstition. What, what's the purpose of a scapula? Why do you wear that particular one, which really is focused on our Blessed Mother? Well, because, um, you know, first of all, scapulars aren't magic, so, you know, uh, um, Catholics don't uh, b believe in that sort of thing. But, you know, they are blessed uh, objects, and uh, th their orientation, in, in my case, uh, toward the Blessed Virgin Mary, is, you know, uh, just a sign of my own consecration. So it's a constant blessed reminder, um, you know, of, uh, of my, you know, consecration to her and, and my devotion to her. And um, uh, so, I mean, uh, I do uh, love to wear it, and it just keeps mm -hmm. me sort of reminding. And I can sort of, you know, uh, sense it, you know, uh, and, um, and it uh, sort of like keeps her close to my heart. So right. um, I, okay. I very much like it. Very good. 
So with that being said, let's uh, get into the program and start with a prayer. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for 66 wonderful years of life and uh, just being able to serve you and your kingdom and uh, um, ask you to continue to uh, send me your Holy Spirit so that I might be able to serve in the same way. Please uh, send that same spirit down upon Doug and I this day and all the listeners uh, to this program so that everything we say uh, may truly edify them, edify your church and your people. Uh, we ask on this uh, special day too that uh, our consecration to Mary uh, through the scapular and through all of the other devotions to her may come to fruition in your kingdom. And we ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And in honor of your birthplace as well, I guess we should keep uh, the people in Hawaii yes. in our prayers, right, with uh, the volcanic Absolutely. eruptions. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Are you familiar with that area particularly? or? Oh, anything? yes. yes. Uh, okay. Well, you know, it's on a different island. I grew up right. on Oahu, and, right. uh, and of course, um, this is on the big island of Hawaii, and it's in Volcano State Park. But I actually, when I was in the first grade, mm -hmm. saw my first volcano, uh, and it was the same one. It was Kilauea Iki, mm -hmm. uh, but it's part of that same formation. Kilauea and so um, uh, you know uh, out there in Volcano State Park and yeah this one's a doozy it's 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 much bigger than than previous eruptions right. and certainly bigger than the one I ever saw right okay very good let's move into talking about the evidence of God from science from credible Catholic of course but before we get there we always have something else to do we got some oh, questions course. from prior shows or people don't want to let you off the hook so here's one for you father <laughs> dear father okay. Spitzer on one of your recent shows, you mentioned five transcendental desires. What are they and how we should seek to fulfill them properly? Thank you. God bless and keep you and Doug and EW10 always. This is Elizabeth from San Diego. Great, Elizabeth. Well, th there are five of them. Initially, they were discovered by uh, Plato, and uh, uh, of course, uh, St. Augustine sort of baptizes them and makes them a very much a Catholic thing. Remember, St. Augustine was a, a Neoplatonist, and of course, he uh, uh, puts them all together in God and teaches us the appropriate way uh, to try to have them fulfilled, namely through God. But let's just go through them really quickly for a second. So it's the desire for perfect truth. Mm -hmm. So we want the complete set of correct answers to the complete set of questions. It's the desire for perfect love. And that goes both ways. It's the desire to be loved uh, by, uh, perfectly and to love perfectly. And of course, as we'll see in a moment, that can only be done through God. Then it's the desire for perfect justice or goodness. Justice or goodness. And it flips back and forth. Uh, you know, in, in, in uh, for example, Plato's Republic, he starts with justice, he moves on to goodness, of course, and in, in the allegory of the cave. But essentially, uh, you know, it's e either one. And, and Augustine, St. Augustine recognizes uh, both of them. Then the fourth one is the desire for perfect beauty and of course perfect beauty can go way beyond the beauty of uh, the mountains and the sea and so forth uh, natural forms of beauty or artistic beauty uh, it also very much can go into the beauty of the soul the beauty of the spirit the beauty of religion the beauty of what uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar would have called transcendental beauty right that is to say uh, you know the theological aesthetic and then finally of course there's the desire for perfect being but I call that the desire for perfect home. In other words, we want to be perfectly at home. And so St. Augustine then takes these five Platonic transcendentals. Those are the powers of our soul, right? I mean, and, and what I, and, and by the way, when we get to module number three, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about this in some detail. Mm -hmm. But for the time being, I'm just going to say what St. Augustine discovered is that you can only have one perfect truth, one perfect love, one perfect justice and goodness, one perfect beauty and one perfect being. And there's, by the way, a very good proof of that. We're not going to go into it today. But if you can only have one of them, then perfect truth has to be perfect love, has to be perfect, uh, you know, uh, justice and goodness, perfect beauty and perfect uh, being. So when you put them all together in one being, what do you have, of course? You have the one perfect being, the one, uh, you know, unconditional, unrestricted being, namely God. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, St. Augustine recognizes 
God alone will be able to satisfy us. He gave us this soul to desire perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being. We could have only gotten those desires from perfect truth, love, goodness, and beauty, and being himself, namely God, mm -hmm. who all those, those, those five transcendentals come together. And so St. Augustine says at the beginning of his confessions, when you put those two statements together, for thou, he's talking to God here, he's praying to God, for thou hast made us for thyself, mm -hmm. and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. The only proper way we will get our desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home satisfied is to be in communion with God, because God alone is perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, and he's made us for ourselves. It's almost as if he's a horizon to everything we desire. He actually actually causes the desire within us. And when he causes that desire within us, at the very same moment, um, he is the satisfaction, the anticipated satisfaction of that desire in the kingdom of heaven. So if we really want to get those desires satisfied, get ourselves on the way to getting them satisfied now, and then ultimately in the kingdom of heaven, what should we do? Mm -hmm. Seek God. Pray to God. Go to uh, you know, Mass and receive the Holy Eucharist within yourself. And then you will see what begins to happen. The Holy Spirit, through all of these prayers, through your, uh, your uh, participation in Mass, etc., the Holy Spirit's going to start trying, uh, not going to try, the Holy Spirit is going to start inspiring you uh, within your heart. And you're going to all of a sudden have this openness to a wisdom and a truth that will take you further than you could have ever taken yourself. An openness to perfect love so that we can actually live with Jesus for, for you know no there's no greater love than this mm -hmm. the, than a person lay down their lo his life for his friends and so you, you see that that kind of openness to that kind of self-sacrificial love and the openness to others love and, and their love of you and of course the openness to ever more perfect justice that you could never le have led yourself to but if you pray if you if you're participating in mass if you're trying to follow the Lord and follow his his way in the scriptures and, and through the church, you'll notice this openness begins to happen more and more and more. And as that openness begins to happen, you'll be led to where you cannot lead yourself. And that's precisely, by the way, what St. Augustine discovers in the Confessions. He can't get there on his own. Mm -hmm. However, Emmanuel, God with us, namely Jesus Christ, can come to us and come to us through the Holy Spirit and through the word that he's left us in the New Testament and through the church. He can come to us. He can instruct us. He can lead us to where we cannot lead ourselves. And ultimately, when we get to the kingdom of heaven, he's going to fill us with the beatific vision. And then we will have uh, just a, a living, we'll be living in perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home with all of the other people in the communion of saints and with the Trinity themselves. Okay, very good. Let's move on to question number two. That was from Elizabeth from San Diego. Next up, we've got uh, Dear Father. At times, matters of faith can conflict with the way that science works. A perfect example of this would be the Virgin Mary's Immaculate Conception and the Immaculate Conception of our Lord. Since these were not ordinary conceptions, are we to believe that our Lord did not have an ordinary birth? Where do we begin trusting in science from faith? Yeah, that, you know, uh, I, I would say that that is not a true conflict between mm -hmm. uh, science and faith. Uh, because science really doesn't render a judgment on whether or not a person is going to be subject uh, to, um, you know, to the uh, concupiscence of original sin, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's not a scientific fact. Okay. So, in other words, you're not going to be able to see concupiscence under the microscope or a telescope or an electron microscope or any other scientific instrument which is looking for scientific cause and effect, scientific agency through empirical means. So, of course, you know, this, this uh, you know, as it were, the stain of original sin, the concupiscence that comes there from mm -hmm. this little, uh, you know, uh, partial breaking, but by no means full breaking uh, of, of kind of the 
the, the sense of God that we have in our conscience, the sense of, of you know, the, the, the true vision and beauty of God that, that originally human beings had before the fall, right? This, you know, before they, the, the, the old ego entered into the picture. That is really not a scientific datum. Remember, mm -hmm. a scientific datum must be an empirical datum. Mm -hmm. And that's not a scientific one. It's the same thing, by the way, that, uh, that Plato discovered long ago when he said, you know, uh, the, the empirical domain cannot exhaust the whole reality of a human being. And today that would mean the scientific domain cannot exhaust the whole reality of a human being. So Plato says, for example, you know, look, look at justice. Justice is one of the most important things about a human being. And if justice resides in a human being, and by the way, Plato considers that not just some kind of a character attribute, he considers justice to be something that floods the entire soul of a human being, transforms its character, and is a real power mm -hmm. to bring about goodness through the soul. So he thinks this is a real, real thing. And of course I do too. St. Augustine did too, right? But it's not a scientific thing. You're not going to look under the microscope and go, oh, there's some justice. This guy's a real just guy. But you'll know, says Plato. So, of course, one of the, the arguments he uses to defeat, uh, you know, the atomists, these empiricists, is literally to say, you know those five transcendentals? Uh, how much love are you going to see under the microscope? And, and how much uh, beauty do you see under the microscope? You say, well, I see beauty but you're not going to be able to empirically test for it. Mm -hmm. All you can test for are the photons that are reflected, that give rise to the sensibility of beauty that you apperceive in your soul. Uh, you know, uh, no scientific instrument that's simply searching for some kind of an empirical result is ever going to say, ding, 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 beauty here, right? So, of course, uh, all these things that we just discussed, mm -hmm. uh, they're not even uh, uh, susceptible to scientific and empirical mm -hmm. investigation. And furthermore, right, uh, at, at the same time, we can see neither is the concupiscence there, the stain of original sin. So that's actually not a conflict between science and faith. Remember what Pope Pius XII told us in his wonderful um, uh, encyclical, I think it was 1942, Divino Aflante Spiritu, and he was actually talking about, you know, well, uh, how do we balance the picture uh, given to us of creation in the Bible? How do how do we balance that right with, um, uh, you know, the scientific picture uh, of creation, et cetera, et cetera? And he said, look, you know, the, the sacred scriptures are for sacred truths necessary for salvation. That's the purpose of the sacred scriptures. The creation story has truths in it that are very important and necessary for our salvation. That God is one. That natural elements are not gods, like a sun god or a sea god, etc. Mm -hmm. That human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God. These are things that science can't ever make a determination on. Alternatively, what's science? Science is meant to use an empirical methodology and a mathematical methodology in order to try uh, to, to give a proper description and explanation of the physical, not the spiritual, mm -hmm. the physical world. And so, of course, when we make the proper distinction, as you can see, the so-called contradiction between the Bible and science disappears. When we make the proper distinction, the contradiction between uh, science and faith itself disappears with respect to the problem of original sin. But a great question. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, next up, let's keep moving along. Father, what do you mm -hmm. think of the watchmaker argument in proving God through science? If you find a watch, you can safely say that someone made it. It would be foolish to say that it came together by random chance and acts of nature. DNA, the building block of life, is millions of times more complicated than a watch. It must have an architect. And this is from Thomas. Well, Thomas, uh, you know, uh, there is something to the watchmaker argument, uh, but y you have to make sure you've got all the component parts built into it. Mm -hmm. so, so the first thing that y you want to do is, uh, y uh, you know, you don't want a naive watchmaker argument, you know, where you say, gosh, look at the bird. 
And this bird is so complex, and its flying mechanism is so complex, and you know the, his you know his eyesight and 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 his coordination to his wings and the guidance system for the bird is so complex. It has to therefore be produced by God. It's just not a bird here. Now, as you probably know, Thomas, things got kind of complicated when Darwin came into the picture and showed a natural evolutionary progression, right, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that that intuition you have, that that's not true. Uh, I mean, I look at a bird and I marvel. I mean, I marvel. I just go, oh my gosh. I, do I believe that that complexity of a navigation system and the eyesight and the wing coordination, the structures and the ability to fly and all the, all the complex design that's required, precise complex design that's required and coordination within the being itself, do I really believe that happened by accident? No. Mm -hmm. Do I really believe that there's any chance that this could occur over th the 3.6 billion years in which life has occurred? Not even close. I don't believe that's a real possibility. So I really do believe absolutely God has a hand in this design. I think God had a, a hand in the design of the whole DNA structure and the whole DNA package, right, that gave rise to that bird. However, you got to be really careful when you call it a proof. Because when you call it a proof, what you're saying to a scientific person is, there is no natural explanation for this. Mm -hmm. Can I prove that there isn't a natural explanation for it? Well, I can't prove it. Mm -hmm. I can say I think it's highly improbable in the time period that it would have to be produced in. 3.6 billion years is not nearly enough time in order to produce this by merely natural uh, uh, causation. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, then a scientist could reconjecture and say, well, maybe there's some biases that are built into the, uh, you know, into the whole factor. And you say, okay, uh, and you know, you have a sufficient number of of biases to create a, a you know a, a winged bird that can actually fly mm -hmm. uh, on, on you know by, by voluntarily deciding to move from here to there etc cetera, etc cetera. the eye coordination all the design that's necessary for aerodynamics yeah okay maybe there is some bias in nature but do I really think it caused this kind of complexity no I don't but I always stay away from calling it a proof mm -hmm. I just simply say okay you know, in my view, I cannot see possibly how this could be brought about by a series of natural causes uh, over the course of 3.6 billion years. I'm going to go with the old Thomas Nagel deal. We don't have nearly enough uh, time to even get to, you know, a, a complex cellular organism like a plant, let alone a human being mm -hmm. with a complex cerebral, cerebral cortex. You know, are you kidding me? So uh, let's just put it this way. The watchmaker argument is a really good and valid intuition. Just call it an intuition. Stay away from calling it an argument or a proof. Because an argument or a proof would have to be to, uh, it, uh, to eliminate mm -hmm. all the, the possible natural causation principles. And in order to do that, you're going to get yourself on a wild goose chase down rabbit warrens and rabbit holes of every kind. Just stay away from those words argument and proof mm -hmm. and just say, I think this is the best intuition I, I can come up with. And what I always do is end with a question, mm -hmm. uh, honestly. I just simply say at the end of the day, hey, uh, do you have another explanation for this? Mm -hmm. How I mean, I can't even program the, the, the amount of design programming steps required mm -hmm. to, to uh, on a huge computer, mm -hmm. right, with huge amounts of memory. I can't even begin to program what is required in order to make like a mechanical bird fly, mm -hmm. right? And you're telling me that this organism here with a little, and I mean bird brain should be meant literally, you know, I mean the three stooges, right? It's a small brain. This bird brain is doing this? Are you kidding me? You know, I mean, I, I'm just, I, I'm flabbergasted by the programming in that bird brain. Mm -hmm. But I know one thing, it certainly works, and I know another thing, I cannot explain that degree of complexity for by any means in 3.6 right. billion years. 
that's my intuition. Avoid the word proof and argument, well, let me and ask you're you, going to be fine. Let me also yeah. ask you to differentiate that from the great clockmaker in the sky idea, the kind of the deist understanding that says there was this watchmaker, but who kind of let everything start it and then walked away versus a personal God who's involved with our daily lives. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with the uh, deistic argument and the so-called clockmaker argument in that sense is, is that what the deist is trying to do is use the word only. The deist is trying to say that's the only part that God had a, you know, a, a role in. He makes the design and that's it and he walks away. And of course we know that many of our founding fathers had that sort of uh, viewpoint and, and so forth. But what it does is, is it forgets about four different elements that we really need. Uh, there are um, what's called leaps in the, in the genetic chain. Mm -hmm. and, and of course right now we don't have a way of explaining those leaps in terms of efficient causation. Efficient causation is what, as it were, pushes from behind. We have to, you know, basically use a final cause argument like Aristotle did to, to actually overcome the problem of the, the gaps and leaps. And, and a final cause, you might remember, draws something to its fruition, I'll say, from in front. So it's almost like God is standing in front of this whole evolutionary process and he's beckoning it forward mm -hmm. so that it, you know, moves when it reaches its natural limit on one level, God is almost beckoning it to the next level, which then of course occurs, yes, through the, 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 the physical laws. But remember, the physical laws of the universe do not explain biological laws they don't expl that, that we would find, for example, in plant life. They don't explain uh, what we call the laws of sensitive psychology. What an animal does when it sees uh, food that it wants, has a desire, feels pain and pleasure, obviously has consciousness through, uh, in order to, to experience that desire, that pain and that pleasure. A and so, of course, that again is a whole new level of design. And then the laws of rational consciousness, mm -hmm. what we call self-consciousness consciousness and the ability to form conceptual ideas in human beings, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially, uh, we, we have these really huge leaps that need to be overcome that just simply aren't in the previous set of laws. Mm -hmm. The laws of physics don't explain the laws of biology. The laws of physics and biology do not explain the laws of sensitive psychology. The laws of physics, biology, and sensitive psychology do not explain the laws of rational psychology and self-consciousness. That's the first problem. We just, you're going to need a final cause and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, put it in the ways of, of many Christian evolutionists. God is the final cause that's, you know, drawing things to the next set of intelligible laws and unities. So that would be, uh, you know, one thing that just, uh, I, I would say, a deist okay. just can't get to. There's a second area the deist can't get to, and that's the human soul, right? And there, uh, you know, if we're going to be talking about this when we get to the second module, but there's a lot of things that human beings do, right, that, that, that animals simply can't do. We'll talk about Nim Chimsky right. and so forth and so on a little bit later. But, the, you know, animals don't do any kind of abstract mathematics at all. Mm -hmm. Animals don't do any conceptual ideas at all. They can't even pass the, 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 an elementary syntax test. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even right. though they can learn 120 words of sign language, they can't distinguish between dog bites man and man bites dog. Right. Etc. cetera. Uh, so they can't say anything about anything to pursue science right. or social science, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, the third thing is, is human beings have a sense of religion, a sense of, you know, human beings, you know, a uh, hundred thousand years ago started burying their dead with all kinds of objects that they're going to take into the afterlife. Uh, frankly, uh, right. dogs and chimpanzees don't worry about the afterlife. Right. Human beings do. They have some sort of what we'll call transcendental awareness, artistic and symbolic awareness. So human beings are what we might call homo religiosus, homo symbolicus, homo mathematicus, homo linguisticus, etc. And so all these various talents, right, that human beings have, we're going to have to go to a transcendental cause, namely God, 
uh, who gives us a soul, right? The, 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 the transcendental cause yeah. of all these uh, powers that we have that chimpanzees don't have, well, we'll call those powers, right. including the power to survive bodily well, death. Well, unfortunately for, gonna... for us, Father, oh. the big clock on the wall says we have to take a break. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick break here. Father Spitzer can Very get good. a catch a breath and uh, get a drink, and we'll have much more ahead <laughs> as we rejoin Father Spitzer talking about our credible Catholic website ahead. A couple more questions still of yours hanging out there that uh, we're going to get to. So stay with us. Much more ahead. Thank you so much again for staying with us here in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe. Evidence of God from Science, part of the whole credible Catholic dynamic new website put together by uh, Father Spitzer and his wonderful, wonderful team. There it is. You can get a look at that and go on the website and check it out. Of course, as we rejoin Father Spitzer out on the West Coast, we had a couple of other questions we wanted to throw at him sure. before we uh, talk more about credible Catholic. A uh, couple of incredible questions. Here's a question I was thinking <laughs> of when you were talking about the idea of people burying people, that religiosity mm -hmm. innate to people. This person said, in a kind of a comment, if God doesn't exist, how would his name ever become mentioned or even thought of in one's mind? Man cannot invent a concept from nothing. A point of reference is always needed. What do you think of this argument for God's existence? And this is by Fournay. And I have to tell you, Father, I don't know how substantive mm -hmm. these arguments are, but you're, you're getting people to think. Oh, I, believe me, I, I think uh, Fournay's on to something very, very important. I mean, it's really, uh, we don't call it an argument, though, it, but it is, again, an intuition. Uh, uh, you know, if you use the word argument or proof, that means you're going to show somebody they must assent to it logically, right? Or they must assent to it because of the, empiric, uh, the, the demands of empirical evidence or logical evidence, what's called a priori evidence. So I, I probably wouldn't use argument, but what right. I would say is that's a very valid intuition. And by the way, it, it really does link into those transcendentals that, as I said, when we get to module three, uh, later on in a few programs from now, we get to module three, you're gonna see this again and again uh, coming up because really uh, um, uh, this goes back all the way to the time of Plato again. Plato didn't think we could really have you know a transcendental idea right that, that didn't have some as you put it reference point mm -hmm. something that brings us to uh, the idea uh, if we're just sitting here swimming uh, in an empirical world around us and and we had no reference point you know that there was something beyond what we could see empirically we would never ask a question you, in order to ask a question, you already have to be beyond the empirical reference point that you have. And it's that horizon, if I can put it that way, that beyondness. That's what human beings are given by God. Now, of course, um, you know, we have many different kinds of beyondness, but one of them is the beyondness that, that, wants, that knows that there's a truth beyond, there is a cup in my hand, right? I, I know there's something more than a cup. I, I want to, every time I get the answer to a question, I'm already beyond that question. I have a sense that that's not the complete set of correct answers to the complete set of questions. And so Plato r realized long time ago, hey, you know, we must have some tacit awareness of what the complete set of correct answers to the complete set of questions would be like. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have some tacit awareness of that, I'll call that God, right? He's the complete set of correct, he's perfect truth, right? He, you know. If we didn't have some sense of what that would be like, we'd never ask another question. The apple would have dropped on Newton's head. He would have picked it up and ate it. Hmm. That's it. But he didn't. And of course, he asked a bunch of questions. And, and the same thing holds true with love, right? It's, it's the same thing. There's a beyondness connected with love. And, and, and how do I know there's a beyondness connected with love? Because I find people's love to be imperfect. I find my love to be imperfect. Mm -hmm. I get frustrated with when people are imperfect in their love, or, or I'm imperfect in my love. But how, says Plato, do I recognize the imperfections in love unless I have some tacit awareness of what perfect love would be like? Mm 
And where would I have gotten the tacit awareness of perfect love from the empirical world? There's no examples of perfect love out there. I can see imperfect love all over the place in the empirical world, but I can't see perfect love. Would I get it from my brain with all of the, 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 the algorithms there? No. I have to get it from perfect love itself communicating to my soul. Mm -hmm. Which soul, you know, makes me aware of what perfect love would be like. Then when I'm aware of what perfect love would be like, then of course I start recognizing, yike, that's not perfect love. That's not perfect love. You know, and of course, how about little kids when they, you know, perfect fairness or goodness or justice. I mean, little kids recognize mm -hmm. imperfect uh, fairness without their parents having to teach them mm -hmm. that it's imperfectly fair. They know almost from the get-go. They're almost screaming with their lower lip extended, that's not fair, <laughs> right? And of course, right. the, the reason that they're, they know it, they know it instinctually because they have an awareness of what perfect love, uh, perfect fairness or justice or goodness would be like. But of course, where did they get it from? They didn't get it from the empirical war they get from their parents right they, they, there's something intrinsic to them and and perfect justice right. namely God is speaking to them as a horizon as it were into their soul that gives them that sense of what perfect justice would be like and then they look at all the justice in the world and they go you know my parents aren't uh, perfectly just the school system is not perfectly just the legal system is not perfectly just etc mm -hmm. etc et so there's always these things that are that are going on as it were these these the transcendental horizons mm -hmm. which are drawing us beyond the merely empirical and that's where I think you're right on the marker uh, when you, when you uh, make that uh, when you suggest that question, because of course, ultimately, where are we going to get the sense of God except from God's presence to our inner soul? Mm -hmm. What uh, Rudolf Otto would have called the numinous experience that draws us to an awareness, hey, there's something there. There's an interpersonal empathetic being out there that is much bigger and much, you know, wholly other is what he calls it, much different from myself. And of course, it's, it's at once fascinating, but it's also at once kind of almost fearsome. Yeah, you can it's big. It's, mm -hmm. it's 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 not controllable by me, you know. Yet I, I feel like it can sort of. It's inviting me to, 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 to into itself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and so, of right. course, uh, uh, of course, you're absolutely right. It's a great intuition, or if you want to put it this way, it's an intuitive argument. Right. It's not a logical argument, right? That that sort of says, yeah, you're going to so need me, a reference point. Let me ask point. you about that, Father. As yeah, a scientist, sure. you, so you believe in intuition. Yeah, I do. Okay. Absolutely. By the way, Einstein did too, mm -hmm. a as a scientist, right? I mean, he said, you know, every good scientist already is aware of the discovery that he's about to make before he makes and articulates it. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty interesting insight. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, by the way, I, you know, Einstein, of course, mm -hmm. was more or less deistic uh, in, right. in his religious outlook. So he did believe in God, but he, he didn't necessarily believe in a uh, you know, loving moral God who would be interested in us, right. uh, more of an Aristotelian God. Uh, similarly, um, you know, uh, a lot of scientists, uh, you know, have that view, but also a lot of scientists are, are very religiously oriented. Max Planck was very religious, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the, our uh, founder of quantum theory. And of course, uh, uh, you know, Heisenberg himself uh, was mm -hmm. also very religious. And, and, and Gerdel, Kurt uh, Gerdel himself was very very, very religious and so forth. So these guys, these really, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, and certainly Sir Arthur Eddington, my gosh, he was religious to the hilt, right? And they didn't, did believe in a personal providential God. They simply weren't deistic mm -hmm. gods. But uh, where did the insight come from? They knew that they were aware of things beyond the I empirical world. Mm -hmm. And in a wonderful quote in, uh, by Sir Arthur uh, Eddington, one of the greatest mathematical astronomers of all time, um, uh, Eddington was, uh, you know, reflecting on, uh, you know, at the end of this book, a brilliant book that puts together quantum uh, theory and, and relativity theory called The Nature of the Physical World. At the end, he has this bizarre chapter from a scientific point of view, but of mm -hmm. course, it's a very real chapter from, uh, you know, a spiritual point of view called A Defense of Mysticism. Mm -hmm. And in that chapter, he says, there are things that, you know, beyond the empirical world, mm 
that science cannot challenge the reality or warrant of. Mm -hmm. There are things in art and things of the spirit, and he goes on and on and on. All these things that we've talked about in the five transcendental desires that you know are so far beyond the empirical world. And he says even science can't challenge that warrant. Because, of course, in order to even ask a scientific or mathematical question, you already have to be beyond, in, in an intelligible world that's beyond the solution you just reached with the previous answer. And so he says, in the, in the sense of the beyond, you're right, you know, the, the light beckons ahead mm -hmm. and the purpose surging within our nature responds. Who's the light? The providential God. This mm -hmm. is said by one of the greatest mathematical astronomers of all time. So it, 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 in essence, your, your intuition, mm -hmm. as, as uh, uh, Eddington would say, as, as Planck would say, Heisenberg would say, Gödel would say, it's, it's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, you know, there's, there's no question about it. Um, we do have an intuition uh, of God that draws us close. You know, I mean, even Eliada, the great, mm -hmm. great uh, uh, philosopher and historian of religion, Mircea Eliada, just put, put, put it, you know, just baldly at one point and just simply said, uh, why is, you know, at that time when he was writing, about 90% of the world was theistic. Now we're down to about 82 to 83% of the world is, you know, religious and, and theistic. Um, it used to be maybe 150 years ago, almost 100%. Right. But, you know, the point is human beings naturally have an awareness of God, they seek the sacred, and that's because we have a tacit awareness of God, mm -hmm. uh, the numinous, the sacred, and, and the sacredly beautiful mm -hmm. breaking into the world to rescue us. We have a tacit awareness of perfect truth and perfect love and perfect beauty and perfect uh, justice and goodness and perfect being and home. We, we, we do, and that's what makes everything unsatisfying in the world. And of course, as Eddington says, even in scientific insight, the light beckons ahead right. and the purpose surging within our nature responds. Okay. So and, uh, your, your argument is good. Your good. intuitive okay. argument okay. is good. Good. Well, keep writing to us, please. We've got a few <laughs> minutes left, so we want to uh, tap into okay. the Credible oh. Catholic, the website, and, and talk a little bit about it again. Uh, yeah. before we get in depth but uh, obviously dealing with the existence of God as we have in so many questions and, and so much of your work over the years as well but let me mm -hmm. ask you in some of the documentation mm -hmm. on the website you talk about yeah. and we'll talk about and you mentioned the seven essential modules which people can see on the screen and you, you refer to mm -hmm. this as an inoculation against the myth virus let me ask you <laughs> what is the myth virus yeah. The myth virus is one that's been created by a, a real secular pop culture out there. And the secular pop culture has suggested the following myth. Science and faith are contradictory. Hardly, as we'll see when we discuss each one of these seven modules, there's a ton of evidence for God from contemporary uh, a a physics and, and science. And we'll be talking about that next week. As we'll see from the modules, right, uh, by the way, CredibleCatholic.com, mm -hmm. just click on those seven essential modules. But you'll see from the second module, there's a ton of evidence for a transcendental soul, uh, you know, from near death experiences and scientific and medical investigations and near death experiences terminal lucidity, etc. There's so much new uh, evidence for the soul from what we call recent uh, philosophical and scientific studies in the area of philosophy of mind. What I was talking about before, you know, the human beings, you know, uh, awareness of conceptual mm -hmm. ideas and the heuristic structures necessary uh, for these things. Also, of course, the mathematical world, mm -hmm. the symbolic world, the religious world, and, and so many, and of course, conscience itself, which constitutes its own remarkable uh, you know argument but it's not this a uh, logical argument, it's intuitive argument uh, for um, uh, God and and God's presence to our souls so this stuff is coming out like mad in in, in all the current philosophical and scientific literature and the third module as we kind of go through the, the the whole thing we're going to be talking about too um, you know the, the the shroud of Turin the uh, I'm sorry we're going to be talking about the five transcendental desires again and through the the five transcendental desires we're going to be looking 
looking at contemporary arguments uh, mm -hmm. for the soul and even, you know, wh when do we think the soul came, when was it infused into the first man and first woman, etc. The, the fourth module, uh, you know, will be discussing Jesus Christ, the mm -hmm. reality of Jesus Christ, and especially the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the evidence uh, for the resurrection on the Shroud of Turin, as well as the evidence for the Passion, and, and, and of course, uh, how it blends together with all right. the other historical arguments that have been done very recently. And in, in uh, the uh, fifth module, uh, we'll be talking about the evidence for the church, mm -hmm. and specifically, not just the commissioning of Peter, but we're going to be talking about uh, nine really interesting contemporary scientifically validated miracles from the Lourdes Medical Commission, from the scientific examination of some of the miracles associated with recent saints like uh, St. John Paul II, and, and of course uh, also uh, with respect to the Eucharistic miracle mm -hmm. overseen by Pope Francis, etc. So we'll look at that, look at the commissioning of, of, of Peter and the historical mm -hmm. evidence that has been really you know, looked at recently and, and, and how important that is and even the, uh, uh, you know, what the, the Catholic right. Church can bring to bear. And then we'll, in the six, uh, 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 I'm sorry, in the sixth module, very quickly talk about the four levels of happiness briefly because right. we've already talked about that in this program. And then finally, uh, another theme we've talked about in this program, namely, why would an all-loving God allow suffering and how to suffer, right. suffer well through your suffering? So when we go through these things, every single one of these things blows up the myth. Mm -hmm. The two big myths that are lead, leaving our kids, leading our kids away. When you combine just the faith and science dichotomy, mm -hmm. just that one argument is leading 21% of our kids away from belief in God and practicing their faith to no faith at all. 21%, that's horrible. And 7% of them are being led away because they don't think that an all-loving God can be consistent with suffering in the world. Okay. We got to do something, about, and there, we can do something about it and that's exactly what the seven modules are intended to do in very easy terms voice over powerpoints embedded videos 90 minutes maximum you can split it into you know 30 minute segments and and, and just take gulps at a time in in language that's that's easily uh, identifiable for mm -hmm. the kids but please go to CredibleCatholic.com. look at those seven right. essential modules download them if you if you're a teacher and show them if you're in a uh, confirmation or catechetical right. class, if you're sixth grade and above, uh, you know, show them off. We're going to have a sixth grade and above curriculum that's going to be coming that on was, uh, right at the end of May, as well as the one we have right, on there that, right that now. That was my problem. I should have gotten a sixth grader to help me download those, <laughs> those, those files, so I had them for the show. That was my first mistake, trying to do it myself, of course. Uh, anyway, uh, let me ask you. Uh, in Doug, a you have a very theoretical <laughs> consciousness. I don't think you have any worries there. <laughs> so in the section where you talk about it, you kind of alluded to it there, and I, I thought it was interesting. You had the four main points that had come up in the, in the survey talking about the things that affect our young people. Science has proven yeah. God does not exist. Suffering proves God does not exist. Humans are just like animals. And there is no proof at all that Jesus is anything special and certainly not divine. So is it yeah. where you have people who believe all four, some believe two out of three or two out of four, and, and there's a whole mix of these things? And you alluded to it a little bit earlier, which is the predominant one that's really underneath yeah, all of that? Yeah, the faith and science one is definitely the predominant one, and that's the real problem. Mm -hmm. That's the one we have to resolve. And, and of course, as you can uh, probably uh, see, if you buy that one, everything else is going to fall too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. The, uh, but as I said, once we can reclaim God, mm -hmm. you know, and, and make and show how you know there's so much evidence from, and we'll be talking about this next week. The Board of Lincoln and Guth proof, and from the, the entropy evidence from mm -hmm. the tuning evidence, etc. Once we can reclaim that, mm -hmm. then we can turn around and we can also reclaim, uh, you know, the soul, the transcendental soul, and even the, the awareness of heaven, uh, you know, in these near-death experiences, etc. We can also reclaim, of course, um, uh, you know, the transcendental desires and, and the evidence for right. the soul from contemporary philosophy of mind. And then we can reclaim Jesus, the resurrection, and then we can work backward into the Gospels, and then, of course, start 
repositioning happiness and the church, mm -hmm. which is really important. You know, you're not going to go anywhere without a church, right? right? I mean, you know, the church guides us. We need a magisterium, you know, and so we have to talk about what's the fallacy of sola scriptura, right? What, you know, you know, kids don't get it right away, you know, but do you think you can really be your own magisterium? I mean, I have what's called the Spitzerian principle of infinite rationalization. Mm -hmm. And what that principle means is give me five minutes and I could <laughs> rationalize intellectually anything I want to do right. if it weren't, if it weren't for Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and the interpretation of the church through its magisterium of what Christ is asking for us. Mm -hmm. There, I got a, you know, there's a bright line in the, in the sand as it were, and there, uh, that guidance has saved me again and again and again in my life. Don't think that intellect and sensitivity, etc., is going to save you and can make you your own magisterium. It just makes you more sensitive mm -hmm. and much more aware of all the alternatives that you can justify with that fine little mind of yours. Believe me, been there, done that, doesn't work, leads to darkness, evil, and death. My thought is, yay for the church, it kept me honest. Yay for the saints, they keep me honest. And of course, at the end of the day, right. what I, I, I'm on the road to salvation instead of the road to darkness. So we got to justify that. And I, I, absolutely, I use miracles of Mary, miracles of the saints, and Eucharistic miracles, the very points at which the Catholic Church is attacked. But I also get right into the strict exegesis of the commissioning of Peter, and of course, its manifestation too in the Gospel of John, and furthermore, uh, in uh, right. uh, Galatians, we have the, 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 the shadowing of that commissioning uh, that, that Paul is quoting in talking about his own commissioning, but he's talking about and using the, the Aramaic name of Kephas, of course, Peter, a rock, and, and, you know, and, and so we see that again and again, and so my thought is, okay, let's get down to that exegesis and then talk about what's the Catholic Church got, you know, in its, in its Eucharist and in its magisterium, in its, its, its uh, uh, ability to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lead and juridically keep the church in unity. Mm -hmm. What's the Catholic Church got in, in you know, the, the other parts of the sacramental life and in its intellectual life that's right. blended with every discipline under the sun? I mean, it's just, it, it's a beautiful church. And, and it, we just got to get back to the kids and say, this is a gem. Don't ignore the gem mm -hmm. for something that's just a mere rock, a fool's gold. And, and of course, but you do have to explain to them. You, you right. do. And, and right. so that's what we're trying to do in the seven essential modules. And like I said, it, it, right. they're free to download. All the, right. the books exactly. are there, the, the, the presentation well, guides for the teachers. Well, the or things, just watch it with right. your kids. One of the things that I thought was interesting that you included in the modules, the idea of why be Catholic? Because some degree today you get this sense that well if at least if you believe in God and you're trying to live out your life uh, you know does it really matter that much uh, especially if you've been given a certain limited amount of light that that's okay we shouldn't bother you with the idea of being Catholic and the other part is is it the problem for Catholics that they have so many riches that in some ways they're spoiled and they don't appreciate them well, probably a little of both, but the first one is the real problem. Mm -hmm. You know, you think because you believe in God, or you think because you say, okay, I, I, I guess Jesus is... Uh, uh, you know, um, risen or something, maybe the Lord. Now, a lot of people don't even get there, but if they do get there, they think, well, you know, I've, I've got Jesus, I've got God, what, what else do I need? Well, the w way we approach it is, uh, you got to take a look at those, uh, what I call the eight deadly sins, right? I put vanity in there uh, as a deadly sin. And, and you got to look at those deadly sins and see the darkness that they're leading to. If you see the darkness that they're leading to, the second lesson you have to learn is how easy it is for you to rationalize that stuff as a victimless thing or mm -hmm. insignificant or really doesn't matter until you get into the full bore of that darkness and boy oh boy can you get lost in the darkness and boy oh boy mm -hmm. can you start sensing that cosmic emptiness alienation loneliness and guilt and boy oh boy can you start flailing around in your consciousness trying to extricate yourself from your depression what you gotta do is 
you got to go to church. Right. Go in there, and, and if you were a Catholic, go to confession. If not a Catholic, ask for baptism. Because I'm telling you, you will see a complete transformation right. of your life. But it's not just that. You can't just go through our RCIA, become a Catholic, receive communion, and not practice your faith. Right. If you practice exactly. your faith, you're going to be on the road to the light. And what and you should you're do not is suck also for check the darkness. out this wonderful new website, Credible Catholic, <laughs> which we'll talk much more about next week. Just before we go, uh, before talking about God, we know God exists. That's why we're going to ask you uh, to do a closing blessing for us, Father. <laughs> Absolutely. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord of all wisdom and consolation send his Holy Spirit down upon you once again to inspire you and to guide you and to protect you so that you may never enter into the darkness too much, but instead be brought through your faith and through the instruction of the church and the spirit within you into the light of God's love through your faith. May Almighty God bless you, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, Father. Next time we'll be talking about the existence of God from philosophy along with uh, revisiting some of what we talked to today. we got to get spend more time on Credible Catholic. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. <laughs> we'll see you next week and all of you as well. Uh, for Father Spitzer, we'll be back with us and we'll be talking about that. Credible Catholic, and also just a reminder, look for us next week. And don't forget, congratulations to EWTN, a lot of Gabriel Award winning programs. One on Called and Chosen, uh, Jim Kelty and John Elson from EWTN, our EWTN News Nightly team led by Lauren Ashburn and Susie Pinto won one under the guidance of Peter Gagnon. So uh, we can all uh, congratulate them on this wonderful day, which is also Father's birthday. So happy birthday once again to Father Spitzer, and we'll see you next week at the intersection of faith and reason. Look for the balloons. We'll see you then.